Hello, welcome to our lecture on oligopolistic market. Uh, for your convenience, this lecture will be divided into two parts. The first part, more introductory, and the second part, more dedicated to some particular models of oligopolistic market. Well, first of all, let's start with what is oligopolistic market about. The word oligopoly comes from Greek word oligos, which means a few. So there will be a few sellers with many buyers in such a market. How much is a few, you might ask? Well, uh, it could be two, it could be five, it could be seven, it could be even 15. Uh, the main idea here is each of those market participants have a significant influence on the market and others know about his existence. So it's different from perfect competition market when a single business was so small that no one would realize it's there. Why do we have just a few businesses in such a market? This is thanks to uh, significant entry barriers. As you may remember in perfect competition market, we had virtually no entry and exit barriers. In pure monopoly, those uh, entry barriers were very strong. And in fact, there was just one firm, one business that was able to overcome those barriers and operate. In oligopolistic market, this is more similar to monopoly. Uh, barriers are very significant, therefore there are just a few businesses that are able to cope with them. The product in oligopolistic market can be homogeneous, like in perfect competition, like oil for instance, could be heterogeneous, like for instance mobiles or cars. And nevertheless, even if it's a heterogeneous product, we see relatively close substitutes in the market. It's like with mobiles again. They are of different brands, but these are mobiles. They are essentially similar to each other and they serve similar purposes. We will assume perfect transparency of the market for our convenience, for simplification. And this is the moment when you have to say one important thing. Uh, there is no one single model of oligopolistic market unlike it was in perfect competition or pure monopoly, where we had that, that, that kind of one single model that explained how businesses would behave. In oligopoly, we do not have one. We have instead a few possible models of possible behaviors. And another difference uh, with regard to oligopolistic market is that we will find game theory as a very uh, useful approach to uh, our market. Our oligopolistic considerations uh, will be simplified as much as it is possible without obviously losing the, the major idea of what oligopoly is about. Uh, so we will reduce the number of players just to two. This is the smallest number where we can say this is still oligopolistic market. One would be monopoly. We are going to consider oligopoly in the special case of duopoly, two players. Uh, that allows to simplify analytical side and graphical representation uh, for instance, you can use graphs with two dimensions, each dimension for each uh, player. With three players, it would be more difficult. With four, five, it would be a substantial uh, difficulty. We will also assume that both players would produce the same or practically, uh, practically the same or very similar product. Uh, so we want to eliminate the problem of product differentiation, the problem of differences uh, in the quality, the problem of brand loyalty. Our two producers produce the same product and no one can see any 
um, significant uh, difference in the quality of those products. We will assume perfect transparency of the market, again for our convenience. So we've got two businesses plus homogeneous product, which would give us four variables at most. The production of the first player, the production of the second player, the price of the offered by the first player and the price offered by the second player. However, if you take into account we've got perfect transparency of the market and the product is homogeneous without any changes in quantity, in quality, sorry, then uh, obviously there will not be any price differences. If people realize what happens in the market if they don't see any substantial differences when it comes to the uh, quality of products why would they pay more so if one of the producers uh, charges more than the other one people would go to the other one so we see there would be no differences in prices one single price that again simplifies our situation because if you look at the demand curve then you must realize that if they sell at the same price p then we obviously know how much they can sell to the market that's q so when we know the price we also know the total quality quantity sold to the market what we don't know is what part of this total quantity q will be taken by the first or by the second player in other words if we know the production of the first one and the production of the second one we know the total production to the market q and therefore we know what would be the price they may charge so that is relatively simple a situation in oligopolistic market. As I mentioned before, we are going to use a game theory approach to understand oligopolistic market. Uh, what is game theory? The definition says it's the study of the ways in which interacting choices of economic agents produce outcomes with respect to the preferences or utilities of those agents where the outcomes in question might have been intended by none of the agents. Okay, no one understands anything. Game theory, what is it about? It is about a game, obviously. For the game, you need at least two players. So whenever you play solitaire, uh, on your computer, that's not a game, in uh, the understanding of, of game theory. So the game is about an interaction between two or more players and the situation of both or all players depends on the decisions they make. So if I play with you, then my situation depends on my decisions and also your decisions if you are involved in the same game. Your situation is influenced by your choices, your decisions and my decisions as well if I take part in your game. As you can see, this understanding of what game is can be pretty useful. So that applies to politics. And players could be let's say political parties or players could be countries right uh, it could be applied to any relation like uh, marriage let's say right wife and husband both playing the game both making decisions that would influence their situation Right? So there is nothing wrong here in saying a marriage is a game. It is. In game theory, this is a game. And there is nothing wrong about it. Really. In order to use game theory approach, you must know the basic notions. So that's a player, which is uh, defined here. The outcome, which is, you could say, the situation 
in which you are thanks to some choices that are made and a payoff and the payoff is the benefit or the cost that you gain in the particular situation particular outcome that happened in the game game theory is based on the three basic assumptions players know which outcomes they prefer we usually know what we want to achieve when we play. Players make choices to get their most preferred outcome. We try to play our game in the way that gives us what we want to gain. And players consider how their choices might affect and be affected by other players' choices. That's obvious if you play chess when you make a move, you always think what kind of response your move can actually produce. Games may be played once, like one-time game, or may be repeated many times. It is important that we know whether the game is played once, a given number of times, infinitely many times, do we know how many times we would play or we do not know? That's all important. There are some games where the results are strongly dependent on the question, do we know how many times we play? One of such games is the famous Prisoner's Dilemma. There are two types of games, actually. The first type are sequential games. Sequential games are, you could say, all those games where you take turns. When you say, all right, wait a minute, it's my turn now. Or you say, come on, it's your turn, we're waiting for you. That's the case of sequential games. So chess is a good example of a sequential game. In a sequential game, we've got a uh, leader and a follower or we've got a leader and followers if the number of players is bigger than two so you could say when you play a chess and you have white pieces you make the first move and when you make your move you do not know the move of your opponent so you make your choice but you do not know the choice of your rival when you make your move and black would respond well black already knows your move so they know your decision that makes them followers you are the leader the leader makes the decision not knowing what followers would do. Followers make their decision with the knowledge of the move made by the leader. Such sequential games with a leader and followers can be played about output or they could be played about price therefore we've got output leadership as a possible model or price leadership as yet another possible model another category of uh, games are simultaneous games you don't take turns here uh, you make all participants make their decisions without the knowledge of rivals choice so rock paper scissors that's a classical simultaneous game you don't know what will be the choice of your opponent when you make your own choice playing rock paper scissors in the turns would be absolutely a nonsense right? the only idea of this game is to play it simultaneously Simultaneous games can also be used to set the output or to set the price. So, simultaneous games 
can actually produce us two models more simultaneous setting the output and simultaneous setting the price and now now let's have a look at the famous prisoner dilemma there is a story to this game so there are two criminals they committed a number of crimes so far and while committing the last crime they were captured and they are arrested and they are interrogated by police officers in two separate rooms each of them gets the following proposal you can testify or you may not testify it's up to you we already have evidence that allows us to put you in jail for eight years you and your colleague but if you decide to testify against your colleague we will let you free you can walk from here free as a bird and your partner will be sentenced for life if you both decide to testify then you will reveal all your crimes and obviously you will be sentenced for longer than eight years but since you cooperate with the police you will not be sentenced for life but let's say for 25 years so each of you has the choice whether to testify or not and there will be an outcome and the payoff the question is should you testify or should you not this prisoner's dilemma is something that you know from many crime movies police officers quite often play this prisoner's dilemma that's why they interrogate the criminals in separate rooms one criminal doesn't know what is the reaction of the other one so this is a classical simultaneous game both have to make their choices they don't know what would be the choice of the partner so that's my question to you would you testify or would you not what would be actually the reasons for your decision whether to testify or not uh, you can say something about your decisions in comments you can leave a comment here or we can use your input in our online meeting you can tell me what you think about it you can also google some possible solutions to prisoners dilemma and to what extent this game depends on whether it is played once or twice many times infinite many times infinite number of times but before you google try to make your own choice whether you would testify or not okay that's the end of the first part of our lecture i hope you enjoyed that like that well you can consider giving me a like if you like that and uh, see you during the second part of our lecture on oligopolistic market thank you